All right. So we're going to wait for us. We're going to give a moment for some of our attendees to join as uh, we are starting this webinar. Uh, we are looking at hopefully some of you who have been following along with our esports uh, series. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you would have seen the Youth Leader One launched. In a moment, uh, you're going to get a chance to ask some questions uh, as we are talking about this whole idea of well, what does it mean to to look at esports and youth ministry in the first place? How does it all go together? Uh, so first of all, let me formally welcome those of you who are joining us uh, on our webinar for tonight, our live Q&A. It is good to have you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alvin. I am the Youth Ministries Associate with the CBOQ. And uh, tonight we are joined by Brett Chapman. In a moment, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, but it, Brett and I have had a chance uh, the last few months, I think it was a few months ago, uh, we met. Uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend. And we started talking about, well, what, is, what does it mean for, uh, for gaming and youth ministry to intersect each other? And it's been it's been interesting conversation so far. And so uh, tonight we're going to get a chance to dialogue back and forth. And for those of you who are attending right now, uh, who are joining on, I encourage you, if you do have questions, uh, click on your chat panel there. And all the chats are going to be coming uh, through to uh, to me. And so I'll get a chance to see what some of the questions that you have. Now, I'll, I'll caveat right now that we may not be able to get to every single question. Uh, but that being said, uh, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. And we're also going to be, as you can tell, we are recording this right now. Uh, which reminds me, so we are recording this right now. Uh, and so by all means, you can always revisit this later. And we would encourage uh, other youth ministries who may not have a chance to view this or to have been on this tonight um, to, to take a look. And then we can always uh, we can always have a conversation later on. I'm sure uh, Brett might be available for some of those as well. So on that note, uh, let me just uh, open us up in prayer and then let's get started here. And so, Father God, we thank you uh, for times like this when we can uh, join together uh, through these different medias. Uh, we thank you for what you provide for us. And even as we continue to explore uh, how you're already working in the digital space, uh, would you provide us with insights through Brett? Uh, would you help us to have a better understanding of the work that you're already doing and how we and we thank you for the fact that you are asking us to participate in that? And so this conversation we leave before you, Holy Spirit, and we ask that you would guide it. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Brett, welcome. Alvin, thanks so much. This is this has been probably one of the most dynamic uh, components of my year so far. It's just been such a blessing to to have an opportunity to talk about ministry, talk about esports, which has become my new focus and my new passion. I'll break it all down in a little bit, but first and foremost, a quick caveat. I live in a fairly dynamic house. I got a couple of boys that are gaming right now, and I got some dogs that are currently sleeping, but if there's a suddenly moment, I might have to mute myself really quickly and just, just to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the dogs don't overtake our, our audio here. So I've actually been in ministry now, uh, in ministry itself, 29 years, pastoral ministry, 25 years. Uh, it was, it's been a dynamic shift over the decades watching ministry change. And I think that, that where I've been over the last 12 years using this digital landscape as an opportunity to reach out to teens with the birthing of YouTube in 2006 and other social media platforms slowly, you know, progressing over time. It's just been a, a really interesting approach. And so I'm here specifically to talk about ministry mission and Minecraft, kind of, in that I've never played Minecraft because I don't do digital Lego, but there's a lot of people out there that do do Minecraft. So take, take it with a grain of salt, but we're specifically going to talk about esports. So do you want me to just jump right in, Alvin, to my kind of yeah, it'd be great for you just to kind of give us a quick little recap of, of what we looked at a couple of weeks ago through that webinar, that conversation okay. you had with Jamie. Uh, but yeah, it, it would be great if you could just give a quick little recap just so that for those, uh, just as a refresher for those people who have seen it so, already. Perfect. Yeah. So I met Jamie um, probably about seven or eight months ago, and he started as a youth pastor uh, doing the traditional youth pastor stuff. He went to Bible college got his degree, kind of jumped into a church uh, with family and friends and just started doing youth ministry and realized that there was a huge segment in his local community that wasn't being met. And so as a result of that, he 
kind of slowly took on this passion idea for this digital landscape and got to the point where the church actually asked him, say, hey, listen, we're no, we see your vision and passion moving forward, but it's kind of not really aligning up with the church. And so he kind of broke away, still partnering with his church as a, as a core supporter, but he started satellite gaming. And so that's where I met him. And it's just been incredible to see the impact that he has in his in his community and how he's connecting with schools and connecting with non-Christian families for the purposes of the gospel. Now, he has two segments of ministry that he uses in satellite. The first is a non-apostasy gospel where he actually just goes to be the presentation of the gospel. And then he invites via relationship kids to come into the ministry side of what he's doing in Bible study and small groups and men and women's groups and, and just finding a way for kids to get connected. And so right now, the facility that he has that, that you saw him in, in the video, he's working out of the satellite office and it's in the basement of a, of a coffee shop, as he mentioned in the video. So it's just, it's amazing what's happening out there and for ministry and everything else. I think that Jamie's story is so mirrored to my own story in that we've seen this shift. Back in the 90s, when we would do youth ministry, we would create these colossal events and we'd have 20, 30, 40, sometimes hundreds of kids show up just because we made something that was really interesting and there was dynamic and they wanted to be a part of it. We got into the 2000s, and the shift that I saw in my ministry was kids stopped signing up for these colossal events because they were waiting to see what their friends were doing. They were waiting to find out, hey, are my friends going? And so I could put together the exact same event as I did in the 90s and have absolutely no participants an hour before my event and then have 60 kids show up or 20 kids show up or six kids show up and, and all of the time that we invested in that. When I kind of arrived at my last church in 2009, I, I entered into a ministry that was using rock band and call of duty as their community call. So they would, they were bringing these kids from high school and they would, they would come and they would play rock band for two and a half hours. We do a, like a five to a seven minute devotional. Literally, that was my time. I was allowed to speak for five to seven minutes. The rest of it was provide supervision and a safe place for kids to come and hang out. And as those relationships grew, it got much, much deeper. And we had a great opportunity to invest in the lives of families and parents and what it kind of looked like. And so we're now seeing many of those kids that are in our ministry now graduate their universities, start their full-time careers. We've got a historian, we've got a, a psychologist, we've got some really talented young people that came through our ministry and now have the root of the gospel and moving out into their careers, which is, which is just such, such a big, big feels for me in the heart. Like I, it, to know that, that we did something incredible, that we changed the direction of people's lives by playing video games in 2009, of all things. It was great. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always interesting to, to see. In a lot of ways, uh, things haven't really changed, right? Maybe the, the medium has changed or maybe mm -hmm. some of the approaches have changed, but some of the core elements hasn't really changed as much. And so kind of give us a quick snapshot again of, you know, when we talk about this idea of esports, uh, you know, help us to frame that again for us. Well, let me jump into the PowerPoint because I do kind of have some, some stats and some statistics that we'll look at. So let's jump into that. And so I will do this one and this one right here, oh, that button right there. There we go. Everything good. You guys can see me. Okay. I don't think I see it yet. Nope, because I don't see you. So let's go. Oh, I didn't click the share button. That was the problem. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. So what is esports? So over the last 20 months, I've been diving down into the industry of esports, which is a very, very small segment of what I've coined the digital landscape. So we have this, this massive space where 
our whole society to some degree or another is connecting in some kind of social media, some kind of video. You know, we've seen the, the digress of traditional television and commercials. People are now consuming, you know, Netflix and they're consuming all the other different mediums that we didn't have when we were growing up. Not to date ourselves at all here, Alvin. But, but the idea that there's something dynamic shifting across the, this, this whole space. So when we look at digital landscape and we look at social media, we can see some elements of maybe some anti-God or some, some applications where people are just missing some of the components of where our traditional ministries or our traditional churches would connect with community because we were so close. It was, it was really easy for a church on the corner to just connect with a high school or the church on the corner to connect with any segment of our population and, and to just be kind of in that moment and in that space in some way, shape, or form. And that those people that were ministered to would then come to activities and events that we would host within our Christian calendar. Well, this has begin, this has begun to change. And, and I think what we see now is, is as we begin to look at some of the actual numbers. So as, as um, 2018, which isn't that long ago, there were only 380 million people that actually play the game in some aspect of digital space, whether it was on their phone, Candy Crush or Farmland or, or, you know, any of the Facebook games, the flash media games, I play eight ball uh, billiards. I love that. Or golf. You know, I love some of these sports games, playing those on my phone, easy access and ready to go today, which when I originally wrote this in 2020, we were looking at about 2.4 billion. So in only two years, we've seen this astronomical impact of the digital space. And as of today, as of this month, 2020, the new numbers is we're actually closing in on 3 billion people are accessing the digital space. Now that's primarily as a result of COVID and people are at home. Because they're at home, they're needing to connect with the people that are around them in some way, shape or form. And so we're looking at about 2.9 billion people. So as the close of 2019, we were looking at the, the global economic market and people pegged this tiny little small segment of the digital space known as esports to come in at around $2.8 billion. But as you can see with the numbers dramatically increasing over a very short period of time, they had to go back and they've had to relook at the numbers and their forecasts are now in the hundreds of billions at $250 billion by the year of 2023. That's only another year and a half away. And we are going to see an absolute shift in, and it's going to be very sudden, unfortunately, I think for many people in the traditional concepts, whether it's traditional sports, where in 2016, we had 111 million people watch the Super Bowl, where the pinnacle esport event that happened in uh, fall 2020 saw 91 million people watch that event. And that event was a month long. The Super Bowl is one evening on one day on a calendar. And this esports event happened over 23 days. And 91 million people watched the entire thing. Like it's, there is this rapid tilt and shift that's happening. And so with this growth, what we're seeing is we need to start asking questions. We need to ask the questions, where is the church? And we need to ask, how are we going to bring the gospel into this digital landscape? What is it going to look like? Well, in order to really kind of figure that out, we kind of got to look at what I'm talking about. So remember, the digital landscape is including all of those almost 3 billion people. It's not esports in its entirety. What we're seeing is, is we've got a very small segment within this, this platform, this digital landscape. And this is esports. The esports is a skilled based competition where the field pitch, court, or battlefield is now digitally created, where players are doing the same thing they were doing in traditional sports, but they're doing it over some kind of integrated digital platform. When we get into competitive esports, 
we're seeing the the absolute masters of their craft. We like to refer to them as the one percent of the one percent that have mastered the approach of their activity, and now they're participating on the global stage. Just to look at some of the number, well, we'll get to that in the, in the next one. So then outside of the competitive esports, we have the streaming component that includes YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, gaming, and the sort. And we're seeing the number of hours almost double uh, it, when it comes to consumption over traditional TV, where traditional TV is dropping. So this is where a single individual will connect with an audience and have immediate access to their followers, to the people that are enjoying their content. And that can be as simple as literally sitting with a cup of coffee and just talking about content and dialogue. Or it could be them participating in a core activity. It, it, could, it could have that activity involving people that are watching and everyone's kind of sharing in the experience. Or it could be more of a kind of a traditional sports watch where you're watching them, them compete. When we look at the, the different la layers of esports, we're looking at the, the three layers. We have a casual, which is me playing golf on my phone, or at least that's kind of what it used to be. And I'll explain that one in just a second. And so we got general public. They're not signed to a contract. They don't participate necessarily in organized activities or events. And there's very minimal reward. Those rewards will typically be within the game where they'll get some kind of reward for completing their activity in that short span of time. Your amateurs, they tend to be signed to contracts and those contracts can include benefits such as housing, board, travel expenses, et cetera. And then the pros are signed to much greater contracts. And let's look at some of those numbers. So I had a young lad that, I was co that I'm coaching now and he was signed to an amateur contract at 15 years old by a team in, in Los Angeles and they paid him $30,000 to play video games from his bedroom after school. And he lived in York. A year later, they signed him to an 80 or $90,000 contract and moved him down to LA, put him in a house with all the other players. And he lived life for two and a half years, playing on the pro scene, traveling all over the world with this team in participating in what's referred to as a LAN event. So it's not using the internet, it's, it's in a stable physical location. So we're looking at the casual, the amateur, and the pro level, the pro players. And our pro players, when we look at the grand scheme, they're typically about 1% of the 1%. So our 2.4 billion or 2.9 billion people, we're looking at 1% of 1% of that. And those are the kids, I say kids, because I'm way too old to, to jump right into that. And so that's kind of where we're at. That's kind of the, the landscape that I'm talking about. And so my vision is to take and apply these various levels of competition, these various approaches to community, because each of these layers creates a dynamic kind of community in that you can have a bunch of kids show up in a, in a church, in a room, and they can all pull out their phones and we can all play the same game. And that's casual. We can create churches. I know when I was going through ministry, we always had volleyball nights and that was our big sport is we'd get together with a church that had a gymnasium or we go to a local school and we would just, throw the ball around. We would play volleyball and do all kinds of fun activities for an evening, have a couple of sodas, take a bag of chips and off the home we would go. Um, when, when I was doing the associate youth ministry in York in uh, Don Mills area, we would do like half court basketball, half court floor hockey, all volleyball. Like we would just do all kinds of different traditional sports. Well, now kids are coming into activities where we want to provide the same semi-competitive type environment and that's where we would access kind of that amateur again they're not necessarily signed to a contract but the the skill range is increased and the competition exists from from one group to another and and kind of going from there yeah i like the way that you you've made the analogy with you know with traditional sports and how a lot of churches tend to to use certain traditional sports 
in that, you know, in, in that kind of drop-in or that engagement setting. So with that then, you know, kind of help draw that parallel now. So, you know, before, as you mentioned, if a church is, was using, um, you know, was using traditional sports, like you said, with volleyball, basketball, that kind of thing, you know, a place for, for, for students to drop in, hang out, shoot some hoops. Some are probably going to be a little more competitive than others. So how does that parallel now look like uh, for a church if they're considering and, and entering gaming somehow? Well, I think one of the first diagnostics we have to make is, are kids coming to hang out in a church or would they prefer to hang out in a digital environment? And there's, you know, several different components of, of, you know, forum style communication tools. I mean, I use one known as Discord um, where, where kids just have an opportunity and it's actually like significantly increased the reach that we can have. So we're no longer reaching just to our local high school. I'm now connecting with, uh, with families literally all over the world. And we're using this platform known as Discord that allows us to connect and we get to play games together. But that then all of a sudden becomes kind of our ministry, right? So, so this is us coordinating a, like a single activity or a single night of the week that would in, would in ha, would house this opportunity of digital connection, right? Like my son's youth group, they don't meet because of COVID. So they meet online and they do Bible quizzes and they'll do scavenger hunts through the house. And, you know, they'll do other fun activities, but it's still all digital, right? There's no, there's no longer that physical component, that physical connection. So. Oh, you're muted. Darn. Things. It's always my settings that get me, right? This is how you know it's live people because we did not set this up whatsoever. <laughs> and so uh, and so help draw that out a little bit now. So from you know as I'm as I'm thinking about some of our churches, uh, you know if a youth leader is thinking, yeah, we we know that let's say out of our 15 youth, maybe you know a quarter of them are involved in some kind of not necessarily the very casual gamer, but maybe maybe they've got they've got a little more significant time involved in gaming. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then how, uh, what are some best practices or, or some kind of those first steps in the next few weeks, couple of months that can help establish that? Well, one of the things that I'm encouraging all of our youth leaders to do is to go to where your kids are, right? Go and be in the spaces that your kids are inhabiting. That's what's going to make the biggest difference to our kids is knowing that we're ready and willing to be in that space. Now, we may not have the competence to play video games at their same level, but we can hang out in the, in the audio chat. We can invite them into our group. We can engage with them rather than engaging. And this is one of the places I found the most success rather than engaging for two or three hours in one setting, engaging for 10 minutes at a time every day right? Posting a quick meme that's like a quote from a, some, uh, like a famous Bible scholar, you know, like Thomas Merton is one that it's kind of really captured my heart right now and kind of my process. And so I'm posting like all the time, like a, like a cool image with like, I'm creating these memes for, for people to see. And the idea is go where our kids are. So when, when we said, where is the church? We're, I'm literally asking, where is the church in the digital space? We have some, I've met some amazing people. Mark Stockhoff out of California. He's a former competitive World of Warcraft player. He's in the top 10 in the world. And he's got a Discord server and he travels all over California hosting tournaments and for churches and big stage events for kids. He has a Twitch account. So, you know, these young, young players can come and experience what it would be like to be in a kind of like a pro environment for a short period of time. So he'll bring 15 or 20 churches from the local area. They'll all together spend an entire Saturday sometimes all online, right? They don't actually travel into that space necessarily. Um, well, California's a little bit different than we are in Canada. They got a little bit more openness, but, but yeah, like that's, that's the way is going where our kids are. Yeah, no, I think I think that definitely makes sense. And I'm just going to remind uh, for those of you who are joining us live right now, uh, I would love if you have any questions for Brett, um, feel free to throw that in the chat and we will 
uh, we'll keep curating those questions as we go along here. Uh, so, so Brett, I'm just going to take a bit of a, a 180 here because I know that for some of our churches, some of the parents of youth, a lot of them are saying right now, "Listen, my my kids on a screen long enough," right? And 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 really, for some, there there's almost this they're they're very adamant about I, I don't want my kids on screens that you know that long. Uh, so, how do you how do you respond to that? You know. I'm going to steal somebody else's quote and I'm actually close to this guy. So I'm not actually stealing it. He's totally given me permission to share his content. And so there's a, an author, uh, his name is Steven Robertson. He's out of uh, Philadelphia area right now. And so we were talking and engaging and I was like asking him like, what is this generation Z? Like what's happening? So all of my kids, I got a 22, I got twins that are going to be 20 in, in several months and, and an almost 17 year old. Now, they all fall within that category of Generation Z. So most of our youth ministries are going to have kids between that 16 to 22-year-old currently. And so their view of the world is not the same view that we have of, our world, of the world. And so I can remember growing up where any digital experience whether it was tv because like my mom when because i wasn't a big homework kid i didn't do well in school let's be fair but my mom would like let me have an hour of tv which meant i could only pick one show a week that i could watch monday to friday now we didn't have pvod like we couldn't record anything i didn't get a vcr until i was 12 and then i still had to fix the clock every week but you know going through this dy dynamic for me, I was trained to see technology as a toy. That was the, the, the start and the stop of it all. It was just a toy for me. Kids today, it's not a toy anymore. It's a tool. So we do need to develop safe practices. But if we treat technology the same way we grew up with it, we're going to significantly hamper our kids expression of the gospel expression of their faith in the space that is quite simply a heck of a lot more comfortable for them than it might be for us mm -hmm. you know my wife and i do a lot of parenting ministry and you know we had one story that came across where a parent refused to put their baby in the playpen because they climbed into that playpen and they determined it was way too small for them so it was way too small for their child when in fact, we actually teach the exact opposite, right? The playpen is designed to be small, but not their crib size either. Like it's an expansion of their world. And so unfortunately we have a problem in the fact that our kids don't know the boundaries because there are no boundaries anymore, right? That digital space is all encompassing entirely and completely. And all you have to do is pick up your phone and you have access to every corner of it. Good and bad. So I want to, so you mentioned that there about, about some safeguards or at least some, maybe some best practices. So, you know, as I'm thinking of some of our youth leaders as they're thinking, well, yeah, they, there's obviously, I think they would, a lot of them would agree, you know, the, the premise of why stepping into a digital landscape makes sense, right? Like you said, for a lot of youth, that, that's that is part of reality. That's that's actually their reality. Um, it's not a, it's not fictional. It's not it's not make believe. It's it's reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, how how would you suggest then for some of our youth leaders in in the way they can both per, I, I don't know if teach is the right word, but at least help to to educate about uh, safeguards both for for the youth that they're serving as well as as well as the parents that of those youth. Well, I, I think that for me, everything starts with education. That education needs to be something we're hungry for. And so we can get caught up in what we already know and be afraid to go and develop that learner's place where we're willing or able. We don't necessarily have to be able to execute on what we learn, but knowledge can be a very powerful, powerful tool. So to, to, to coin another phrase from our parenting model, we use what's referred to as a parent-directed model. So we model the behavior we want in our kids. So um, having safe practices, meaning I'm participating. Now, I participate at a higher level when it comes to my digital experience, but 
learning to not be toxic. And toxicity is simply not being authentic to my true self because a keyboard becomes this gateway to all kinds of dark, dark behavior. Because from behind a keyboard, there's some kind of an, um, anonymity, I think is the right word, where we're, we're, we're hidden a little bit. And, and so we, have, we don't have our real names exposed. We have gamer tags and such. But again, this is the idea of as youth workers today, we need to invest. We need to get into that space. Finding out, you know, which games our kids are playing and at least learn some of the conversational cues around the game. If all of our kids are playing one game, which hopefully, but very mostly not likely, um, finding healthy tools, people that are communicating the game in a healthy way. Because like, I really enjoy playing League of Legends right now. And there are some horribly toxic individuals who create a very aggressive approach to that game. Now, I found some very holistic, Christian, in fact, people that will talk about the game in a healthy way. They don't necessarily talk about God or Jesus, but they share in that moral, ethical, right, positive, good behavior that we would look for uh, in, in that component. The other thing. Youth workers, connect with your parents. Shift that model. Like I shifted back in 2010, where I was spending 90% of my time with my kids in my youth ministry, and then 10% with my parents. Well, all of a sudden, I was spending 60, 70% of my time communicating with parents. That was youth ministry. Because the idea that you might, and I say might, have 40 hours a year with a kid in high school. Their parents have 4,000 hours with that same child. So if you're going to invest time and you wanna see positive good behaviors, connect with the parents, helping them connect with their kids, right? We don't inhabit the same space we did back in the early nineties when, when a kid would come to church four or five nights a week. And eventually then go off to Bible college and you'd be their mentor. And, you know, no, it still does happen, but it doesn't happen nearly like it used to. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And so, so I'm kind of thinking through this a little bit now. So, you know, for a youth leader who's thinking, okay, you know, I, I think I understand at least uh, ways to step into that, right? And just even the idea of, of, like you said, even just asking their students, what exactly are you playing? What's helpful? Uh, you know, all that's, uh, you know, I think those are some great steps to to investigate and to find out, to, to be exploratory, right? Like you said, I, I appreciated the, what you mentioned there about taking that learner's posture, um, mm -hmm. because I, I mean, I know in my age now, <laughs> I'm definitely not uh, as, as, uh, always on top of things as maybe some people can be. Um, but that being said, and so for a lot of our youth leaders, they're, they tend to be the advocates for their students uh, with church leadership. And so I'm wondering now, you know, for, for youth leaders who are starting to put some of this together, trying to figure out, okay, well, what does it mean to bring it to, you know, whether, whether it's the elders, the deacons, the board of directors, uh, whatever their governance might be, uh, what are some suggestions that you might have for what they need to consider in bringing those ideas and proposals to their, you know, to, to their board? Well, I would, I would genuinely encourage you to read the story of Nehemiah because it's not going to be an easy journey. You're going to have to put the sackcloth on. You're going to have to weep over your kids and the space that they're inhabiting. And you're going to need to posture yourself in such a way because our eldership is just that, they're elder. And they don't understand, most of them. And you might, if you might be in a very progressive church and get very, very lucky. And all my prayers would be that every youth pastor would have at least one person on their elder board that understands we've got to go where we have never gone before in order to reach the kids we've never reached before. Like that's one of my prayers for every church throughout Ontario and Quebec right now, throughout the whole world. But keep it in our audience. 
where that doesn't exist, understand that you're going to have to fight the battle within and the battle outside. And that's where Nehemiah and having to build up the wall. And the whole vision, the whole mission that Nehemiah had was in order to protect Jerusalem. That was the mission. Like, we may not even realize, but our investment in this digital landscape is what's going to save the church. We are going to have, we are going to be needed sooner, hopefully, than later. And hopefully more people will join us in the mission of understanding that if we're not engaging in the digital landscape, we are not engaging with the upcoming generation. And the gap is, is growing. And so when we get into Joel 2.28, we start talking about all of the generations gathering together. That's the space. So when we can teach Generation Z to be patient, to be kind, to be loving to the grandparents that know nothing of this thing you call Twitch, but if you can introduce them to these, these activities that, that exist out there, our grandmothers of the faith will be the ones that will cheer us on when we do our events online because they'll jump on and they'll say hello from, and they won't even know what they're typing, right? Like they won't even know how they're engaging. They'll just know that their prayers are being answered because, wow, goosebumps. Because God, the gospel is going to, be, is going to go, right? The, the, it is going to get presented. It is going to work. And so we just need to find that, that way to be very respectful of the people that have gone before us. And hopefully they have a connection where when, when they were at our phase in ministry, they had to take their church to a space that it had never gone before in order for it to get to where they were called to take it. And, and that, that can be the hardest conversation. Um, I, I got fired for one of them. <laughs> I did. I got, I, I was asked to leave the church because I wanted to minister to kids on Facebook mm. and but that was where kids were meeting. And I'm like, okay, it happens. It does. It's unfortunate. But my prayer is that nobody that watches this video has to go through that process. Mm -hmm. That my prayer is that, and, and encourage them to sit and watch this video with you, that the digital landscape isn't scary. God is bigger than what's out there. And we just simply need to bring his light into that darkness and it and we win every time no i think that's uh i, I like the way that you've you've helped to to frame um the approach uh, you know both in terms of the the stance of humility but at the same time there there's a stance of of rem, of understanding why are we stepping into this in the first place right it's, it's just it's not it's not just another thing to try right there's actually something very, um, very profound and very significant about what does it mean to engage in the digital landscape. And, and, and so let, let's kind of break down the, the kind of nuts and bolts in this. Because, uh, uh, you know, I think for some of our youth leaders, they're thinking, okay, well, uh, let, let's say, let, let's say at least uh, in principle, our leadership is good to go on this. At least they're, they're willing to trust in what we're going to do here. Uh, but, but someone, let's say for, for me, where I, I have no idea how to, <laughs> how to use a Discord server. I'm not even sure, like, what, like what kind of infrastructure are we talking about here? What kind of, you know, what kind of money is helpful here? What kind of leadership personnel are we, it would be worthwhile to, to recruit? Like, help to, I, I understand that not every, uh, you know, not every digital ministry setup is going to be the exact same. But at least what are some what are some considerations that some of our youth leaders at least need to be thinking through if we're going to follow through with this? Well, you you pegged it right there. Not everyone needs to be at the same space. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, not every church is going to need to be able or not only do they need are not only are they not going to be able, but they don't have to be either. Right. Discord is easy to learn if you're willing to put a couple of hours into learning it. It's easy enough to learn and it can become a, a, a way to communicate with your kids or your, 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 your youth within your community. And you'll see it actually grow because kids will start inviting their friends to it because it's a cool space to hang out. Right. There, there is very commonly in my path of ministry 
where kids were always excited to introduce me to their friends. One, because I never judged them. They could come in cursing and swearing and doing their thing and they could be belligerent and yep, excellent, you're here. Because now that you're here, you get to see the light. And that's what will be uniquely different. So what are the costs? Like what are the, the actual costs? Right down to the nut and bolts of it all, it's going to cost you time. And if your church is on your side, hopefully they can understand that that time is going to have to be taken from another area of commitment or ministry and such. It may not last for very long because once you've learned it, now you can then begin to expand your exposure into another area and you can evolve. And hopefully with healthy communication with our church leadership, that can happen, right? The, the idea that there will be some kind of, of, of maybe a, a, like a soft curtain between what you find entertaining when it comes to esports versus how you're learning about esports. Um, so so that's, that's one of the things. So time, number one. Number two, if you're going where your kids are, there really isn't any major expenses. At most, you might have to get yourself a better phone. And, or, and you can get a new phone every two years in Canada. Like it's really pretty simple to get a good phone um, or a tablet. If you're playing more of the flash style games, um, getting a PC Now you may already have a PC and you may not even realize that it's perfectly well and good that it will play all the games that your kids are playing. It may not, but it might. It'll at the very least let you watch your kids play games. Because in a lot of cases, our kids are actually streaming. They're actually using YouTube and Facebook and Twitch to put themselves out there. As like my, my youngest, both of my sons actually stream. And, and, and they enjoy interacting with that digital community. We can interact with that digital community. We can be the host and we can watch our kids. We can, hey, we're going to have a watch party. We're going to watch Johnny play League of Legends on Friday night. We're going to watch him play for a couple of hours. He's going to have his friends out. And we're just going to, you know, chat and hang out and have a good time. Come join us, right? Or, you know, do that and have a five-minute testimonial. Have Johnny come on and just share his testimony in between a game or two. And, and have, you know, we can turn these very same activities it's the same approach that we've always had to ministry. It's just the platform has shifted slightly. Um, but cost-wise, you know, it can cost tens of thousands of dollars if you're looking to do something at more of that professional kind of level. But even at an amateur level, if you're going where your kids are, your kids are already there. They're probably technologically already ahead of you. So you don't have to get them to catch up to you. You have to catch up to them, which is not usually as, as, as expensive or of an investment. Yeah. That, I mean, I think that's, uh, I'm sure for some of our church treasurers, that's, you know, <laughs> that's music to their ears. Right? Ooh, yeah. Um, we don't have just... to create an esports lab. It's going to cost me $19,000. <laughs> Trust me. If any one of you that are watching this video have access to an esports lab, it's going to cost $19,000. I want in. I'll hire me, please. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm kidding. No, I'm not. So, yeah. And, so uh, it's, I think that one of the things that's interesting there, right? You mentioned that there may be there may be a shift, even temporarily, or depending on how long term you know, this this kind of uh, involvement includes, right? It's uh, is that discussion more almost on a uh, almost on a, a on a job performance level, not not even job performance, but in terms of expectations, right? Where mm -hmm. are people spending their time? I think that's that's part of that key, um, and. Actually, let me take that angle for a moment because, uh, you know, for for someone who's sitting down with, their, you know, their senior pastor or maybe uh, for one of our volunteers that they're sitting down with whoever their direct report is, uh, how do you begin to um, to understand what that accounting looks like? like? In terms of the accountability part of things, um, how, what, what does that conversation potentially look like? Or at least what does a youth leader... Let me rephrase that a bit then. What kind of accountability should the youth leader be offering to whoever they report to? 
this is a hard answer to give because I have the answer I would want to give and I have the answer that I need to give. So let me start with the answer I need to give. One, you need to honor your leadership. You need to find a space with all humility and grace to stand by your leadership and, and see and execute on ministry as they are there. One of the most powerful convictions happened for me. I was a youth pastor way back in the day. And I was at this, this refuel event where we brought in a guest speaker. There was like 50 youth pastors that showed up at this activity. And the speaker got up. He was a senior pastor of a church. And he said, how dare you think you have a vision bigger than me? And everyone's like, oh, no. But they broke it down in the gospel. And he talked about, you know, David and Jonathan. In that Jonathan was the armor bearer. And I felt this instantaneous conviction of being an armor bearer in ministry. Now, I have no desire to be in senior pastor ministry because I think adults are icky. I'm, yeah. But, but as that call, I had to accept a place of submission that was submitted to my senior pastor and the vision in the ministry. Now, Ideally, you're in an environment where that senior pastor trusts you and trusts the passion that you have for ministry and the way in which you're seeing and execute on that. It doesn't always happen that way. And I'm a perfect example of that. I have had to move on from churches because they just didn't see ministry the same way. And I wasn't able to bear the armor of a vision that didn't at least a little bit kind of connect with what I was trying to do. Now, I was in another church where the senior pastor got fired because he was doing too much of what I wanted to do. And, and it just didn't work out. Right. But he had given me like carte blanche. I could do whatever I wanted when it came to this digital approach to connect you with kids and family. It was still when we were able to phone people and they'd actually answer the phone. So that was, that was a huge help for me. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of it. Uh, help to elaborate a little bit though in terms of what so so there's the, that's the accountability in terms of um my relationship with uh, my supervisor mm -hmm. uh, i guess one of the things is sometimes it, it is kind of hard to track well what you know when are you online when are you not online when is that considered ministry oh, yes, time okay. versus non-ministry time i think you just even uh, you yeah, know how so, do you yeah, yeah. so the, the second half was the so that was their version so now my version I'm a youth pastor. I'm never not a youth pastor. Deep breath. You're always on. Right? You're, you're always present. You're always on. You're always available because that's the call. That's the heart. Now, there are people that will tick their time box away. And once they hit to that certain time, they're like, okay, I'm off. I'm not working. Um, I haven't met many of them that actually do that they they get to their tick boxes so they okay okay my bosses are happy and these are in churches my church bosses are happy my eldership knows that i've committed but now i'm going to continue going to the ministry because so and so got drunk at 11 30 and was afraid to call their parents so who did they call they called me to come pick them up that happened a lot right and and so you know, I, I had one kid flip his car over because he was drag racing somewhere. And who did he call first? He called me. And then I had to call the parents and say, okay, first and foremost, everybody's safe. <gasps> right? I had to figure it all out. But but that's that's the job. That's the heart of what we have been called into. And I think that if we if we if we're willing to boil ministry down to 40. 50, 60 hours a week, I think we're missing some of those, those really harder conversations to, to dial into. That's, that's, the, that's the challenge that we face. So ministry-wise, I'm, I'm never not mm. doing ministry. I, I joined, so coming back to our Discord conversation, I, I joined a Discord um, because they're participating in activities that I enjoy playing video games and hanging out. I'm not there 24 hours. And this announcement post comes up and said, it says one of our veterans, his name is Gamertag. 
was in an altercation where he was shot yesterday. He is okay, but he was shot in the head. So his girlfriend and the girlfriend's grandmother were assaulted by one of her ex-boyfriends. He came to kill him, shot him in the head, beat the girl. Police were called. He was caught and everything else. He's going to live. No brain damage. Praise God. But this is 24 hours after I arrive in this discord. So guess who I get to be? I get to be the resident counselor, coach, pastor, therapist. My gamer tag, if, if uh, anybody watching the video understands how this works. So we have a pseudonym and mine is actually chaplain. And for the last 20 years, my gamer tag has always been chaplain. So people will always ask me, are you actually a chaplain? chaplain? I'm like, yes, I am. And it has amazing consequences, both good and bad. Some people think I'm crazy. Some people just love the fact they have someone to talk to. No, that is, that is helpful. I think that that reminds us, uh, you know, some of our, you know, both the both the the more formally written expectations, but also some of the that's part of the call, right? I think what mm -hmm. you're what you're adding there is is part of the call. Uh, what are some, you know? Because I know for, uh, let's say even for me, or for some of our youth leaders who, if they're, they're very much a newbie at all this, uh, you know, who are some, uh, some recommended resources, people that you'd say, whether it's on, on Twitch or YouTube or other places, that's worth following to learn more about uh, a lot of what, does, what it means to minister in, in a digital landscape? Well, I mean, the two people that we've had in our, in our interview sessions, uh, Jamie Harris out of Satellite Gaming, they're a fantastic resource and they're doing a lot of gaming. They have a, fan, a really, really great Discord, very interactive. Uh, their community is still relatively small, um, but it's large enough that he connect with me. And then there's um, Chris Gwaltney who interviewed me for the parenting video. I'm not sure if anyone here has had an opportunity to watch it. If you haven't, please go watch that. That's going to be our next Q&A. And that one's going to be a juicy one for sure. But uh, Love Thy Nerd serves thousands upon thousands of people. Like they have a Facebook group that is, is greater than 3,000 people. And not all of them are Christian. Most of them, in fact, are not. They're just nerds. And these nerds, Chris and, and, and the team of founders that got together and founded their ministry, they developed a, a way to connect with, with this culture and to be in a space that they were bringing that light into, into a dark, unknowing place. So Love Thy Nerd. You can go lovethynerd.com, I believe it is, and just search Satellite Gaming in Google. I'm not sure their exact extension. Um, but maybe we can kind of post that out into the, into the tag of the, of the video. Yeah, we'll definitely add some of those, uh, some of those recommended resources to the, to the YouTube description when we post this on YouTube later. So thanks the other, the other two, Alvin, any of our youth leaders that are watching this are absolutely more than welcome to join us monthly for our international esports call. Hmm. And that would be a great resource too, because they would get to meet people literally internationally that are using esports to deepen and, and, and find the greater depths of their youth ministry. Hmm. We've got the young lad in Brazil that's using FIFA soccer. Uh, and it's the video game version. And he had like 120 salvations at one of his events just three or four months ago. Like absolutely incredible, the, the work that he's doing. We've got Pavel and Roman in Houston that are doing FIFA as well. And they're using it to minister to the immigrant families. And so they're doing both physical soccer camps and they're doing this, this Twitch version. And they're ministering to people all the time. So lots of really good people in that call to connect with. That I think a lot of people will will see. Yeah, definitely, and we'll so uh, yeah, so we definitely will. Uh, I guess is it helpful for us to include the link into the? Yeah, into you the can include. Yep, yeah, you can include the Zoom link because um, it doesn't change. It's it's a it's a standing connection, uh, and then the next one is May the seventh. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. No, that, I think, and and I've had a chance to jump on that for a couple of times, mm -hmm. and. And to be able to to hear and learn what, as, as Brett was saying, what some people are different doing in in many different areas, in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Brett, as we're about to wrap up here in a couple of minutes, uh, I'm just going to ask you, kind of kind of help us to see down the path here a bit. 
assuming a church starts taking some of these steps, right? Stepping into, into online gaming as a, as a way to connect with, you know, the, the friends of their youth and, and kind of go from there. Um, and just even seeing where uh, potentially how, right now, how the pandemic has affected a lot of our churches on a broader scale. Uh, what, what do you think digital ministry might look like in three to five years from now? No, it's, it might be a little bit hard to kind of picture at this point in time, but, but you know, as far as some of where you, the trajectory of you see some of this going, uh, what do you think are some of the, some of the anticipations we might have about this, about this whole idea of digital mm-hmm. ministry? Well, I think one of the one of the the core, and I'm going to come back to Stephen Robertson's new book that's coming out shortly, pumping you, Stephen. Uh, he's got a book coming out called Aliens Among Us, and the the development of that conversation is his. One of his quotes is, "Any student that entered grade one in September of this past year, by the time they graduate college, 65 percent of them, their jobs don't even exist yet." No one has even thought about the job that they're going to. And it's everything is changing. And I think 5, 10, 15, like I have really shifted my scope of ministry where I'm now using a 30 year plan. I don't think that we can effectively do much in five years. I think that one, we need to soften the hearts of our leadership that are going to allow us the means to engage with youth culture in a digital manner. I think that we are still going to and should be able to to minister to our cultures that are immediately in the physical vicinity of our churches, but there should be an aspect of our ministry in the next five years that is entirely and completely digital. So if we're hiring a youth pastor, we're also hiring a digital pastor. You know, we're we're having to fill these roles in, in unique ways. And, and create what I refer to as digital missionaries, missionaries that are not necessarily uh, pounding the Bible or preaching the gospel overtly, but they're, they're more subtly bringing the fibers and the ethic and the morals of what it means to have a faith-based relationship with God and moving in this digital space where we're hosting digital cafes where everyone's got their cup of coffee from 7.30 to 8 o'clock in the morning, and we're just going to pray and, and just talk and share, and people are going to have two minutes just to kind of you know encourage one another. And then after school, I know that our kids have been on their screens the whole day, but come back to the earlier comment, it's not a toy anymore, it's now a tool. If it's a tool and they can learn how to effectively use it, their mental health step is not going to be as critical as we might think it is. They're only responding to our fears and uncertainties, right? I pulled my son out of school at the end of grade nine with his permission, of course, because he wanted to play video games professionally. And we've been moving in that direction. He starts at about 10, 11 a.m. in the morning and he goes till well past I'm in bed. And he plays video games nonstop. Well, He's on his screen nonstop. Is he playing all the time? No, not always. But some days he does. But his math, his comprehension, his strategy, his communication skills, everything has enhanced. And and we're going to bleed that conversation right over into our parenting in our next conversation of what it actually is going to look like. Kind of, and I think that if you're here as a youth leader, come and be part of next week's, come and be a part of the parenting one, because I think that. We need both, right? It takes a village to raise our kids now more than ever. And are you able to be in a space where you're going to influence your kids? Are you one of the people that your kids picks up the phone and says, oh my goodness, this, 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 and this happened. I can't tell my parents. Are you getting those calls? Are you getting those text messages? Yeah. No, I think that's uh, I think that's probably a good place for us to end off, uh, recognizing that in, in a lot of ways, while this is still new for a lot of us, just even trying to wrap our heads around um, even the shift of of the paradigm of how we see digital spaces in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think th- there's been this shift that's no longer just 
a space where you go to get away. This this is reality now. This is mm -hmm. just as real as the geographical locations you've never seen and been to before. They're just as real in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, how do we then step into that? Uh, and and for us, and maybe I'm biased in saying this, but a lot of times our youth ministries tend to be the the kind of the the forerunners in some of this and helping the rest yeah. of the church to better understand, you know, what, mm -hmm. what are some ways to step into that? So no, Brett, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm grateful for the insights that you provide mm -hmm. for us Thank and, you. and the what different way, I think you've, you've challenged us both in understanding, uh, you know, what are some, uh, what are some postures that we need to be taking uh, moving into mm -hmm. this? Uh, but then also having some of those more tangible answers, because I know, <laughs> you know, there's probably a list of FAQs that uh, our youth leaders probably have about, they know what some of their leadership might be asking for. And so mm -hmm. just to even for you to address some of those with us is, is helpful. So appreciate your time. And oh, we just had one question here that just popped in here. Hopefully you got time to answer this real quick. Sure. Yeah. All right. So should youth leaders do surveys with parents and kids? Um, absolutely. I think that's a great way. I mean, if you can't do it organically, then doing it formally is is just as effective, depending on on how many. I, I find in in my experience, surveys never really worked because getting getting that out of somebody was more dragging, kicking, and screaming kind of approach. Mm -hmm. I'm not a paperwork guy. I hate paperwork. My wife does all the paperwork. So if we ever had a survey, I'd never have any input because I just wouldn't participate. But if we were in a flowing relationship. And it might take a little bit longer to get the details, but yeah, I, I think, you know, surveying, talking with, asking our parents, okay, so our kids are spending nine, 10, 12 hours of screen time a day. Are you seeing anything? What are your concerns? What are your fears? What are your uncertainties? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll share that in the parenting one. I've got another really good one there. So there you go. There's a, there's a teaser for the parenting one. So uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, for those of you who are watching this, uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us next Tuesday, May the 4th um, at 7 p.m. Uh, that, that link is part of cboq.ca slash esports. So you'll find a link there. That one does not require registration. So you can share that with as many people as you like, mm -hmm. even last minute wise. So we would love to see them there. But in the meantime, uh, Brett, thank you again for your time, uh, for, your, for your wisdom, and for helping us to see some of the things that you've, you've grown to understand and, and mm -hmm. not just in not just in terms of, of ministry development, but also uh, how it's impacted your own faith and how mm -hmm. you've been able to, to be Christ in many of these spaces. So appreciate your time. Great. Alvin, this has been just an amazing process. It's taken us quite a bit to get to this point, but it's been a pleasure and an honor. And I just look forward to seeing more opportunities to serve the gospel mm -hmm. in this space with more people. It's going to be great. All right. Well, for those of us, for those of you who are on, uh, have a good evening, and hopefully we'll see you next week.